Well, good morning and welcome to Worship for Lucan Presbyterian Church. It's the 10th of January and it's the second Sunday of the year. And I give you a very warm welcome joining with us. I don't know where you are. You're maybe at home here in Lucan, in Dublin or somewhere else in the world. Wherever you are, you're very welcome with us. Let me just start by reading a verse from Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 8, a very well-known verse. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. This morning we come together virtually, but we are together in order to take refuge in our Lord, to hear from his word and to praise his name. Let me pray for us before we start our worship together. Father God, we thank you that because of your spirit living within us, having redeemed us and bought us back, that we are considered to be your sons and daughters, making us brothers and sisters in the Lord. Father, we thank you for your spirit working within each one of us, that you have bought us back at the cost of your son and that you now bind us together in worship. Wherever we are and whatever we're going through in our joys, our sorrows, our sadness, confusion, anxiety and hope, we pray that you would unite us as your family here in Lucan. Bless us in this time of worship, we pray. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your head. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Of God.
tempted to say that was great singing because that's what I normally do on a Sunday but I can't hear you so I don't know whether your singing was good or not but I hope that that song blessed your heart. I'm going to read from the scripture now and you might want to grab a Bible and open to the New Testament and look chapter 10. Again another really familiar passage for us. From Psalm 34 verse 8 we said taste and see that the Lord is good And now we're going to read from Luke 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan. So you can see a theme building here around the word good and goodness. So Luke chapter 10, and it's from verse 25. So please do open a Bible and follow along with me. And I'm reading from the New International Version. This is the word of the Lord. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds and poured on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. The parable of the good Samaritan. This is the word of the Lord. Now, of course, because of all the restrictions placed upon us, um, Church life as we know it has not been functioning the way it normally would and that has been the case since the 15th of March last year. And we've been trying to keep things going through online services and home groups and youth and children's ministry 
as best we can and offering pastoral support as best we can, although that's largely been through the telephone. Uh, but I uh, would ask you just to keep an eye on your inbox over the next few days because I will be sending out a mailing to each one of you outlining what's coming up between now and Easter in our church calendar. That will involve information on home groups and youth work and children's work, pastoral care and Sunday services and a couple of other things outside of LPC in the wider Christian community that you might be able to participate in. So do keep an eye on your inbox for that. Can I also ask you in view of what I've just read in the Good Samaritan story that we would continue to be good neighbours to one another. One of the things I have really appreciated over the last months has been the simple phone call or text message. And it would be wrong to assume that everyone else is texting and ringing everyone else uh, because uh, we all have a role to play. So can I ask you this week as well to renew your effort as, as tired as you might be and as fed up as you might be with everything that's going on to renew and double your efforts to reach out to people from church who you know maybe someone that you sit beside or sit near or a family that you've got a particular connection with and give them a phone call drop them a text message if you live near enough maybe even consider going out for a walk with someone so that we would feel that level of connection with one another feel particularly for those who live on their own and although i'm quite comfortable here on my own i can be all too aware of how long the evenings can be when you don't have anyone to engage with or anywhere to go so do please look out for people around you particularly those who live on their own so let's go into a time of prayer before we sing again Let's pray together and for one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are in control of all things. We each have a vision of you that is unique to each one of us. We relate to you in a slightly different way because each of our relationships with you is personal and individual. But collectively, we can call you our Father. As you, your Son, taught us to pray that Lord's Prayer, to pray our Father. And in doing so, we acknowledge that you are the one who is above all things, in control and command of all things, and who has always been and always will be God, Father, Son, and Spirit. We thank you that as we call you Father, that it indicates to each of us that we are your children and therefore we are brothers and sisters. Give us a great sense of awareness that we belong to this great family of God in our Lord Jesus Christ who redeemed us and bought us back at the cost of his life so that we might be called sons and daughters of the living God. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his perfect life and example. We thank you for the parables that he taught us, one of which we have just read. And we thank you for his work on the cross to stand against evil and to redeem us back from the brokenness of the world over to which we had given ourselves. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would give us your spirit working within us, producing good fruit in season. And we think of those fruits of the Spirit as detailed in the New Testament of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness and self-control. And we pray that by your Spirit you would grow those fruit within us even during this season of separation that we might know that we are not alone but that we are with you the one who promised to be with us and draw alongside us. We pray that you would minister into the deep needs that each one of us has, personal, emotional, physical, financial, familial needs, 
that you would minister by your grace deep into the darkest and most private of places. Where a phone call or a text message or a walk in the park will not reach, we pray that you would pour your grace into those places. Minister to us in our sorrow, our anxiety, our grief, and encourage us in our faith, our hope, and our love. And remind us that one day very soon, just as Easter is coming, that we too will one day be together with one another in your meeting house to praise your name. Bless each one of us wherever we are. And we ask this in faith and confidence in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Beauty for brokenness, hope for despair. Lord, in the suffering, this is our prayer. Bread for the children, justice, joy, peace. Sunrise to sunset, your kingdom increase. Shelter for fragile lives, cure for their ills. Work for the craftsmen, trade for their skills. Land for the dispossessed, rights for the weak. Voices to plead the cause of those who can't speak. God of the poor. Friend of the weak, give us compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts, the tears fall like rain. Come change our love from a spark to a flame. Refuge from cruel from fear cities for sanctuary freedoms to share peace to the killing fields scorched earth to green Christ for the bitterness his cross for the pain God of the poor friend of the weak give us compassion we pray, melt our cold hearts, the tears fall like rain, come change our love from a spark to a flame. Rest for the ravished earth, oceans and streams. Plundered and poisoned, a future and dreams. Lord, in the madness, carelessness, greed, make us content with the things that we need. God of the poor, friend of the weak, give us compassion. Until the nations learn of your ways Seek your salvation and bring you their praise God of the poor, friend of the weak Give us compassion we pray Melt our cold hearts, the tears fall Change your love from a spot.
The message this morning is on the topic of goodness. We read in Galatians that one of the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. So I want us to think about goodness in a time of brokenness, which I think suits the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. Because we see brokenness all around us and during this pandemic it has been elevated and magnified and even in our news in this past week, we see how badly this world is broken. Politics is broken. Education is broken. The economy is broken. The environment is broken. Families are broken. Lives are broken. Dreams, careers, hopes, all broken. And now this coronavirus pandemic and its third and most deadly wave here in Ireland with these shocking statistics and insane numbers. What a brokenness. We see this brokenness all around us. It's profound. And this is not what God had in mind, you know. He doesn't revel or delight in the brokenness of this world. It was not his big idea for us. So it's heartbreaking that it's happening. We are living in a time of brokenness. And so this morning I want to say to you as a child of God, that within you there is the fruit of the Spirit called goodness. And there are three ways that we recognise biblical goodness in this world. First of all, biblical goodness is redemptive and restorative. Biblical goodness weeps and works for the redemption of the world. The goodness of God pours into the cracks of the brokenness, sometimes the chasms of brokenness that we see around us. It tells us in Acts 10, 38, the Bible, that Jesus went about doing good. What was it that he was doing that was called good? Well, yeah, he was teaching and he was praying, but he was healing and restoring and redeeming. The goodness of God restores and redeems that which is broken. Goodness weeps and works for restoration. This lovely image of Jesus on his resurrection morning being um, uh, misidentified as the gardener. Remember back at the beginning of the creation story, there the Lord God walked in the garden in the cool of the evening. We'll hear at the resurrection, Jesus is walking not in the cool of the evening, but in the dawn of the day. This image of Jesus as a gardener tending to and restoring the garden that we had destroyed. Of course, we are part of the human race, part of the, the race of the first Adam. And Adam thought that he could discern goodness for himself by eating from the tree. Remember the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But God will know that you will know good and right from wrong. But by eating that, he brought judgment and sin and ultimately brokenness into the world. His role as the first great gardener, subduing creation and bringing order to it was short lived so thousands of years later, there needed to be a second Adam, a second gardener who would properly subdue and bring order and restoration to the world. And that, of course, is Jesus. So Jesus, the gardener, shows himself as the second Adam in the garden to begin the work of restoration in and through his perfect goodness. And you and me as children of God this morning follow his call. He said in John 14, you will do even greater things than me. So we as followers of Jesus, as he went and did good, bringing restoration and healing and redemption, will do even greater things than that. So biblical goodness is something which redeems and restores. Secondly, biblical goodness, when we encounter it, is beautiful. 
The goodness of God is not a utilitarian good. It is a beautiful good. And we recognize this goodness by its beauty. Psalm 133, how good and how pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Psalm 34, which I read earlier, taste and see that the Lord is good. Even in creation, when God looked and saw the beauty of what he had made, he said it was good. Goodness is beautiful. When I first visited Bilbao in Spain, I wanted to also visit the famous museum, the Guggenheim. And there are some impressive installments in the Guggenheim which would naturally pique the interest of someone who had an engineering background. These large engineered blocks and shapes of metal sunk into the ground to give an impressive sense of space, journey and size. And I was very excited for that visit. But as we walked the banks of the river toward the museum and rounded the last corner and the building of the Guggenheim came into view, it was the beauty of the building itself that arrested us. The gigantic curves on the exterior of the building that caught and reflected the light. The industrial size of the building with its unfolding and interconnecting shapes was stunning. And it's no wonder so many people consider the building itself to be the more artistically impressive piece than the installations that it hosts. My point here is that in an entirely unexpected way, I was captivated by the beauty of something that I was not expecting. It was so stunningly beautiful that I could not help but stop and stare captivated by it. The same is true when we see something that is genuinely good. Biblical goodness is beautiful. It's stunning. It's awe-inducing. It's not a goodness that has its roots in a kind of moral superiority or subjective opinion or kind of idealism. It's awesome beauty cutting through the brokenness and darkness and badness we so often see. Biblical goodness can be seen because it is beautiful. That's why Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven, becoming like a city shining on top of a hill. When we do good out of the spirit working within us, in the biblical sense of that word, we create something that could be called divine art. When God's people do good deeds, we put a frame around something beautiful that attracts the gaze of the world. What we do becomes a portal, a window through which the broken world can gaze and taste and see and experience the goodness of God and the world he intended. Biblical goodness is beautiful. And our good deeds, your good deeds, my good deeds, born of the Spirit of God working within us, lived out in the midst of the rubble, paint a vivid picture of what God's desire for all of us is. It's not amazing. So biblical goodness is beautiful. Biblical goodness is restorative and redemptive. And thirdly, biblical goodness is confrontational. We can't understand good without a reference point to God. And if we can't understand good without a reference point to God, then we are never going to have a vision of justice in the world. It will only be a thin humanistic vision of justice. But when we understand that there is goodness and that evil is just an attempt to destroy, kill, steal what belongs in God's kingdom and what works for human flourishing, if we don't have that biblical vision, then we will have a thin version of justice in our world. 
But when we see evil seeking to destroy, when we see evil seeking to destroy in word, in action, through neglect, out of self-interest, when we see evil seeking to destroy, goodness rises up to reclaim and resist. Goodness rises up to reclaim and resist. It acts to take back what has been broken or stolen and it acts to take back what is good. I'm not talking about believers being good living or being goody two-shoes. I'm talking about provocative, powerful goodness as a force of redemption in the world. Paul says in Romans 12, Do not be overcome by evil in the world, but instead overcome evil with good. I think that's a really striking verse in this moment that we're living through. All the brokenness around us is a product of evil and sin in our world. And it is easy at the moment to be overcome by it. Listening and reading the daily numbers of the coronavirus in Ireland, the UK, across the world. Thinking about the injustice of killings in our streets that seem to be confusing to us at best. Looking at what's happening in the United States of America with the incitement to violence. Romans 12 shouts loud, do not be overcome by evil in the world, but instead overcome evil with good. So goodness should have a a resistant, defiant, justice-orientated effort to overcome the evil we see in our world. Edmund Burke said, The only thing necessary for evil to flourish is for good men to do nothing. Goodness is not passive. Being good is not to be beige or vanilla or bland or quiet. Goodness born of the Spirit of God in our lives when acted out and spoken out, goodness confronts evil. Goodness says, not on my watch. Goodness says, I'm going to step up to the plate. Goodness comes between the victim and the oppressor and does not, is not overcome by them, but seeks to restore justice in this world. Think of the death of George Inchenko in Blanchardstown. Think of John living homeless in a tent in Lucan. Think of Yolanda and her two children under the age of four in direct provision. Think of world leaders and their careless inflammatory words. Think of those who are peddling drugs in vulnerable communities and bust their money down the M7. None of this is good. It's evil. And we, God's people, with the fruit of the spirit of goodness in us, growing goodness in us, We speak, we act, we weep, we work, embodying the goodness of God, not just to live good lives, but to confront evil with good. Goodness is growing in us as a fruit. It is not a subjective goodness. It's not a moral superiority kind of goodness. The goodness of God is growing in you and me as fruit. And that goodness, when spoken out and acted out, restores. Just like Jesus bringing about a new creation, we become partners with him in that restoration. It restores and redeems. It's also beautiful. People see it as good. People see it as a frame around a beautiful picture a portal for them into another realm. It restores, it's beautiful, and most powerfully, it confronts. It refuses to let evil have the final word. By embodying the goodness of God, 
We acknowledge the goodness and dignity inherent in every person. Sometimes expressed through art and activism, and volunteerism, sometimes in social public discourse, seeking to change the narrative of our world today. However way we demonstrate the goodness of God, we do it to restore with beauty and in confrontation to evil. The fruit of the Spirit is goodness. As the Spirit of Jesus produces fruit inside you, one of the things he's going to do if you're following him, you're going to feel rising in you an instinct and a heart to rebuild, reclaim and restore. The Spirit is going to want to produce a beauty in you that will come out of you and will frame up a different story and show the goodness of God in this fallen world. And it will produce activists, activist instincts within you that will say evil will not have the final word in this fallen world. It will push you and provoke you to act into circumstances and confront evil that others would walk on by. Remember that story of the Good Samaritan. He was compelled to act. So my prayer for us today is that the Spirit will grow in each one of us, in you and me, in such a way that we are compelled to resist the evil of this world and live for good. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Clouds are gathering, the fire of judgment burns How we have fallen, O Lord You stand appalled to see your laws of love so scorned And life so broken Have mercy, Lord, forgive us, Lord Restore us, Lord, revive your church again Let justice flow like rivers And righteousness like a never-failing stream Oh, Lord, over the nations now Where is the dove? broken Oh Lord Our precious children starve the tools of war increase Their bread is stolen Have mercy Lord Forgive us Lord Restore us Lord Revive your church again Let justice flow like rivers and righteousness like a never failing stream Oh Lord Dark powers are poised to flood our streets with hate and fear We must awaken Oh Lord Let love reclaim the light Your kingdom come Have mercy, Lord Forgive us, Lord Restore us, Lord Revive your church again Let justice flow Like rivers And righteousness Like a never-failing stream Yet, O oh Lord, your glorious cross shall tower triumphant in this land, evil confounding through the fire. Your suffering church display the glories of the Christ. Praise as resounding. Have mercy, Lord, forgive us, Lord. Just
just a slow like rivers and righteousness like a never failing sweet and mercy Lord forgive us Lord restore us Lord revive your church again oh let justice flow like me Like a man.